Be the right club. Be the right club today. Yes! Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Be The Right Club Today podcast. You know, we talk a lot about mindset on this podcast, and our next guest is one of the world's leading sports psychologists. Hells from, from Europe, has worked with some of, the, some of the best players in the country, including Darren Clark, Lee Westwood, Paul McGinley, Graham McDowell. He's the, uh, he hosts the Brain Booster podcast, Mr. Carl Morris. Carl, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chase. Uh, thanks for having me on. Looking, looking forward to the chat. So, Carl. Let's jump right into it. Tell us about the art of the books that have been such great sellers. I love in particular the art of playing the game. So, Yeah, I think um, there there was a phrase I heard a few years ago, how um, I think it was a a guy called Chuck Hogan who said that, that we're drowning in information, but searching for knowledge. And I think if you look at, you know, what's happened in the game in the last, sort of 20, 25 years with vid- video, first of all, and then more recently the internet and, you know, launch monitors. There's, there's, there's a huge amount of science that, that's that been thrown at golfers. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a Luddite. The science definitely has its place. There's no question. We, we know a lot more about the golf swing now than we've ever done, which is great. But I think in many ways it's been, it's been at the expense of the, the art of playing the game, you know, and the art of actually creating golf shots. And, I think the books that we've done, Gary Nichol and myself, it's kind of, hopefully it's a bit of a counterbalance really where, you know, we say use the science well, use the science appropriately, but maybe connect back to that sort of creative side of you that, that you can go onto the golf course and, you know, start to paint some pictures with your imagination of, of what you could do on the greens and the short game. And, you know, I, I, was, I was heavily influenced how but my hero was, was, was Seve Ballesteros, who was taken away from us far too, far too young, tragically and and you know growing up I, I got a chance to spend some some time and see him play and and he, he was a, he was a genius at work you know you know you played with him and you know what he could do around the greens and and the sad thing was towards the end of his career you know when his game had gone a little bit the only shots that he, he could play really well was when he was in trouble when he when he was in trouble and he had to create shots he was st- he still had the amazing ability to 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 conjure up artistic shots uh, from the most impossible of places. So I think hopefully the books, as I say, have, have tried to just balance things out a little bit. Well, Seve was one of my favorite people to play with. I, I played a lot of golf with Seve and uh, would have called him a, a, a magician, really. I mean, he hit shots that most people only dreamed about being able to hit, and he did it with regularity, uh, especially from <clears throat> 150 yards in. Uh, he was, you know... He was a magician around the greens, but he did a lot of stuff with loft that other people couldn't do. And, and I believe how that he, he said that around the greens, when he was faced with a shot, you know, he, he would get movies playing in his head of options that he could go for. And he would kind of grasp hold of one of these movies and, and the movie would then inform his body what to do to actually play the shot. And, you know, we, we, we get told time and time again that golf's not a reaction sport. But actually it is because you, you react to what's going through your mind before you step into the shot. You know, and if, if the only thing that you've got going through your head is a bunch of positions in the golf swing, I think there's a whole piece missing there. You know, we don't, we don't often, we, we don't talk enough about imagination and creativity. And I think, I think when, you can, when you can encourage players to give themselves some freedom to go out on the golf course, you know, we, I, I, I've seen it so many times with over the last number of years that, you know, players almost become blunted in their imagination that they spend so much time hitting shot after shot from the same place on a range. And I'm, I'm a big believer in using the golf course more, getting out on the golf course and, and seeing the golf course as a place to train, you know, getting out there with maybe three or four clubs or whatever and seeing what you're capable of doing. And, you know, the number of people who say that, when they, when they sort of embrace some of these ideas, it, it makes them feel, you know, childlike rather, you know, getting out there and just connecting with that part of the, that part of them that got them taking the game up in the first place. Go ahead, Chase. Uh, Doc, with, with regards to Seve, why do you think he was, um, he was obviously so skilled around the greens. Why do you think he 
wasn't as skilled off of a tee or hitting full shots? Do you think it was because he, you know, his imagination, he almost viewed that as boring, you know, from a, from a sports psychologist world, like what would, if you could go back and work with him, what, what would you have maybe tried to do to help him, you know, bridge that gap a little bit? Yeah, I think, I think certainly in, in the early part of his career, um, you know, there was, there was more imagination employed in, in the long game, but I think he, he, he did head down a route of starting to go in search of technical perfection. You know, it's legend on the European tour that the number of different coaches that he had, he sort of flitted around. And I think, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. Would, would, would Seve, if he could have his time again in terms of the long game, maybe just stick with one coach and stick with some, stick with a blueprint where he could, he could gain confidence in his, in his technique, but also then unleash the incredible imagination that he had, you know, to, to play the game. I think, you know, we only have to look at how he, how he developed his game that, you know, it's, it's, it's gone down in folklore that, you know, he came from a relatively poor background and, and he, his first, his first experience of the game of golf was, was with the three iron that he made himself. He fashioned a three iron that his brother had, had gave him, put a shaft in there and he learned to play golf on the beach at Pedrena. And he learned to play all kinds of different shots with one, with one golf club. You know, if you think about that, you know, I'm not suggesting everybody goes on the beach with a three iron, but you, you think about that, Chase, how, how difficult that would have been to actually put loft on the club and play different shots from such tight lies on the beach. You know, he, he always said that when he got, when he got wedges in his hand, it was, it was, it was like cheating. I remember, I remember watching him give a clinic at Wentworth a number of years ago and, and he was in there and he was playing these amazing, just soft lob shots out of the bunker with the three iron. There was a bunch of other guys around and Nick fouled on one or two other players. And he said, you know, give it a go. And these guys are drilling these things into the, into the face of the bunker. And they, you know, Nick has said, he said he was just, he was just a genius with that, with that three iron. But it, obviously what did it teach him? It taught him, it taught him a connection with the tool in his hand. He understood how to apply loft. He understood about path and face as a result of direct experience, not just, not just theoretical knowledge. So in, you know, I played a lot with Seve in the eighties, a lot. And we were at Oakmont in 1983 and it was Tom Watson, Seve Bellasteris and myself in the last group in the third round. And Seve never hit a driver. He hit one irons all day long. And if you remember just a few minutes ago, I said he could do a lot with loft. That was his problem, as a matter of fact, because he wanted to hit it high all the time. And no one hit it higher than he did. And, if you know, when he would hit the shots he hit with the three iron out of the bunker, he was adding loft all the time. He had to learn how to add loft. Those other guys were drilling it into the face because they were de-lofting the club. And, you know, this is a really good point for me to make a, a statement. We are all good at something and we are fair at other things. And we spend our whole life trying to be good at the things we're fair at. <laughs> and, you know, I think maybe, we, you know, because we want a complete game. You know, whatever people say we're missing, that's what we want the most. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I look back at Seve. Seve and I have told Chase this story several times. Seve and I played a lot of practice rounds together because I was trying to learn what he was doing with his short game. He's trying to learn what I was doing with my long game. And he used to say how. He says, you hit the long shots. I play all the short shots. We always win. And, and I, you know, if nothing else, that made me feel really good because there's one of the great players thinking that I was special at something. And I was thinking he was very special at something. And, uh, I, you know, Sevy, you're right. He left us far too soon. We could have learned a lot more about the short game if he could have lived long enough to, to, to share it because – one thing about golf is, you know, we tend to share things we know after we're through beating people with it. <laughs> yeah. And I think the sad thing is, Hal, is that, you know, there's a current generation now that, you know, you mentioned, I, I mentioned Seve a lot to, you know, kids that I work with. And, 
you know, there's a blank look comes on the face. The, 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 the name, unfortunately, doesn't mean an awful lot, which I think it's a, it's a great, great tragedy, really. And, I, you know, I do encourage young players just to become, become students of the game and just look back into the history. And, you know, it's not, it's not just all about the latest gadget and the latest technology that, you know, there's some, there's some, there's some, some great things to, 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 to see if you can go back into some of those past experiences. You know, I, 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 um, I received um, uh, a book recently by um, a photographer called Dave Cannon, one of the best photographers on, on the European tour. And he was, the, he was the guy who took the famous picture at St Andrews, you know, the matador pose when Seve, Seve hold, that, hold that putt. And Dave was actually, actually stood at the back of the green. And a number of people said this to me, that when, when, when Seve hold that putt at St Andrews, that the ball was never going in, really. It looked like it was always on the high side of the hole. But he said, he said the ball just dive left at the end. And, and interestingly, Seve, Seve said that it was just he willed the ball into the hole. Now, you know, I, I know that sounds a, you know esoteric thing to say, but I mean, you'll, you'll have felt it that playing golf with him, that the, the, the spirit that he played the game with, the, 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 the will and tenacity that he had. And when he, when he tapped into that, there were times that it was literally magical. He made magic happen on the golf course, didn't he? Well, you go back and you talk to any of the great old players. They will tell you about an instance in their golfing career that they wanted it so bad and it was not headed in. And they wanted it so bad that they actually moved the ball with their will. Mm. And I've actually had a couple of occasions like that in my life where, I, I mean, it's missing for sure. And I'm staring it down with my will saying, you got to move. You got to move. And I mean, Raymond Floyd told me about several times in his life where that happened. And I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all that you tell me that Seve wanted it so bad that he moved the ball himself. I really believe that happens. I think it, and I think it's, it's, it's an interesting exploration as well, isn't it? That I think, you know, what was going on in those moments when you mentioned Raymond Floyd and your experience and, and Seve, is it, is it that in those moments you just, you're so involved in getting the ball into the hole. You're so involved in the task. You kind of, you kind of completely lost in it. So that there's a, there's a blending of technical, mental, and physical, even spiritual, that that brings it all together. And and you know, some amazing things happen as a result of being in those states. It's a it's a moment that nothing else enters your mind other than that. Yeah. And there's very few times where you actually are at that state in golf where there's not other things. I mean, I talk about reducing the size of your world all the time, you know, when you can finally get to the point that there's nothing there, there, but that, well, then that's how, that's the small world you want to play with. Graham McDowell um, worked with for a long time. He, he sort of told me that a few occasions um, when he held up the putt to win the, the Ryder Cup and when he, when he, he won the U S open at Pebble beach. He felt like, especially on the back nine at Pebble, he called it bandwidth. And he said, he said he felt like in his brain, the bandwidth narrowed where there was only enough room for the number, the number on the shot, the shape of the shot, the target, and just, just everything else just blended into uh, the background as a result of just being homed in. It's almost like his brain switched into a special mode at that point where the only thing that happened, the only thing that was existing was the actual task at hand. And I think, you know, these instances, all right, every, you know, guys listening to the, and the girls listening to the podcast, they okay, well, that's okay for great players. But I think that the lesson is that, you know, whatever level that you are playing the game, you, you can move in that direction in terms of just being a little bit more obsessed with your shots and a little bit less obsessed with your swing, because, I think you know you, you. You two guys will have seen this. Even even relatively high handicap golfers, you get them on the golf course, and they get in a in a situation where they're in trouble. Where there's there's really only the the, the golf course dictates that you've got to play a hook or you've got to play a punch or a high shot or whatever. And even relatively high handicap players in those situations, when when the task is so clearly defined, can play some pretty good shots. So I think you know what what we're talking about here is. Is, is being able to tune much more into the shot as opposed to just being lost in technique. 
So, so Doc, you mentioned a, a phrase, paint the picture or paint, painting pictures. Um, you know, we, we like to get into how different people learn differently. You know, we've got more, some people are, are more artistic like Sevy was. You've got, you know, Mr. Hogan was a bit more engin engineer-like. Um, how do you say tailor your focus with your players based off their personalities um and and do you you know we had mr we had mr tom watson on here a couple couple months a month ago or whatever and he he mentioned you know when he won the the famous us open at pebble when he chipped in he mentioned that he was hitting it terrible and he actually went to a swing had to go to a swing thought on the on the on saturday you know before the round to to, to get him back into play how do you balance the act between being so artistic and visualization and then also technique and, and for guys that can't visualize as well. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's so important, Chase, that, you know, the number one thing for me when I'm starting working with somebody is to actually, is to actually get out on the golf course and in the real environment and find out as much as I can about that, that, you know, unique individual. What is it that they've done? What was their education like? What did they, what, what were they good at at school? You know, if they're in business, what made them good in business? And, and actually dig as deep as possible to find out more about that personality. Because I think the danger always with coaching is we, 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 can, jump, we can jump straight in and we see a fault perhaps in a golf swing and we jump straight in at that, at that issue as opposed to understanding more about the, the individual. But I think then, you know, it, it's very much about understanding what makes that individual tick and as, and, and as you say there are there are times that you know you can have the best visualization in the world but if your golf swings all over the place you're not going to be able to make you're not going to be able to match up what you're trying to do with the golf club with the, with the shot that you've seen in your mind and that's where i you know that's my kind of dream of, of, of coaching in the future that that coaching is much more about a collaboration of the shot whereby the coach is working with the player, what shot is he trying to play, having clear images of that. But then if there's not a clear understanding of what they need to do with the golf club or what they need to do with the body, the coach then collaborates with them on that. You see, I, I think you can ask two questions when, you, when you're working with, with, with a player. You can either say, well, what's wrong with my swing or what's wrong with my shots? And if you ask the question, what's wrong with my swing, then you can disappear down some rabbit holes of, of opinion. You know, it's too upright, it's too flat, it's this, it's this, it's that, it's something else. But if we start on the premise of what's wrong with my shots and get really clear on what it is that you're trying to do with those shots and then collaborate with whatever's needed technically to apply the club in a better way, to understand what the concept is, then I think we're moving in a, in a direction. There was a great book years ago written by a guy called Stephen Covey and it was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the seven habits was begin with the end in mind. And I think in golf, we don't often do that. We don't begin with the end in mind in the sense that what is, what is the end result of a, of, for a golfer is the shot that you're trying to play. And I think we can sometimes get lost in all the details of what you're doing and what you're trying to do in the swing at the expense of really, okay, what is this all about? What am I actually trying to do with the golf ball? And I think you know, I, I say to a lot of the players that I, that I work with that on, a, on any given day, you, you, you might not have your golf swing, but you'll always have shots that you can play. There's always shots that you can go to. And sometimes, you know, asking yourself the question, what have I got today? It, it, may, not be, it may not be pretty. You know, it might not be the nicest thing in the world. But if you, can, if you can function with a golf shot to get it around that day, and, you know, as you guys both know, it, 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 all of a sudden it can click. The feeling in the swing comes back. And then you're away for the tournament. But, you know, you'll have experienced this, Hal. I'm sure in, in, in all the wins that you had, you didn't, you didn't have your golf swing with you 100% all of the time. For sure. You know, to me, I was always, I felt better about the day when I got something out of nothing than when mm -hmm. I didn't get anything out of something really good. There were a lot of days that I hit it great and scored very average. And then there's other days where I didn't hit it all that good, but I really maximized the score. Those were the days that I actually felt really good about everything. You know, used to we talk about it on here a lot. You know, Tiger infuriated everybody when he said he beat everybody with his C game. Well, the truth of the matter is that's when you feel the best because mm -hmm. you got the most out of what you had. 
And I mean, you know, in all cases, not just golf, but in all cases, when you're getting everything you've got out of what you have that day, that's a good feeling. And, you know, it ties in with, as we understand it, and everybody's experience of this will be the same, is that the body doesn't feel the same two days running. The swing doesn't feel the same two days running. It's, it's an inherently variable game. You know, and I said to a lot of players, you just mentioned it there, your C and your D game. Be very, be very proud on days that you've got your C and your D game, but you've thought so well that you've, you've somehow got it round in 71 when really it should have been a 75. And that's right. 71, that 71 has kept you in that golf tournament. It's not put you out of the golf tournament. But then, you know, you get a feeling the next day, you, you know, you roll a put, put in on the first and the second or whatever, and you get slightly different feeling and there's a bit more rhythm in the swing or whatever it may be. And all of a sudden you click into your B game and you might shoot, you know, 10 under at the weekend. But that, that, winning, that winning tournament actually started with getting it round in 71 with a C or a D game on the Friday afternoon. Right. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the zone? I think the zone is, is one of those. It's one of those things where it's a bit like saying to somebody, "Go to sleep, Chase." You know, if you if you try to go to sleep, you, you, don't, you don't have much luck with it. And I think if you try and get in the zone, you know, you, it's, it's the last place that you're actually going to be. You know, for me, what it what it what is the zone? The zone you you can look at it in, in a lot of different areas. You you could have somebody who's reading a book who's in the zone. You could have somebody who's watching a, a ball game who's in the zone. And what does that mean? Is that they're, they're, just, they're, just, they're just lost in something that they're incredibly interested in. And, you know, when you, when you go on a, on, on a golf course, again, one of the suggestions that I have with, with a lot of players is, is just become really, really interested in the golf course. And I'll, and I'll say to them, who's your opponent? And they'll generally say, well, it's myself. And as well, it's not yourself. And they'll say that it's the, it's the golf course. And I said, well, it's not actually the golf course. Your opponent at golf is the guy who designed the golf course. Because whoever designed the golf course doesn't really want you to make a load of pars and birdies. Otherwise, every par four would be 350 yards long with no bunkers and no water. So I, when you get really into the head of the course designer, and, and just go out there and say, well, what, what is he trying to get me to do here? How can I outwit the golf course? The more you become interested, then you get to a point where you're absorbed in the golf course. When you're absorbed in the golf course and the shots that you're creating, I think that's the entry point for the, for the zone. And it's just an inherently pleasurable place to be because you, you're just lost in something that you're fascinated by. And I think sometimes what can happen with us with the game of golf, we, we, we get away from that because we end up playing what I call this for that. And a lot of young players fall into this trap whereby they get good at the game early on, they get some success. And then all of a sudden, it's all about where you're going to be in six months and are you going to make the Walker Cup team and when are you going to turn pro and all this kind of stuff. It's great to have those dreams and those ambitions, you know, those directions, but ultimately, the only day that we've got any agency over is, is this particular one that we've got in front of us now. And I think a great question that players can ask themselves you know, at any level is before you go out to play a game of golf is what, what am I committed to today? Because today, today literally is all, is all we have, you know, and, and when you can commit to something today that absorbs you, that interests you, you know, not only do you enjoy the game more, but you actually probably reveal more of your true capabilities. Wow. That moved me right there because that's actually a, a fact. You know, we, that's all we got. You know, we, we break it down to just the next shot, but you know, I love the fact that you had it the day, you know, like right now when I go out and play golf, I pull a lot of shots, just getting old, old man disease. You know, I can't get up and out of the shot like I need to. And uh, you know, you mentioned a second ago, Steve Covey's book about get engrossed in the end. What are you trying to accomplish? And, you know, if I could just play a whole round of golf where everything started out on the right side of the fairway for once, everything, that would be a success for me. But, you know, most people, they're not happy with that. They want all these different shots, which means you got to control path and face and everything else all the time. Uh, 
hard to reduce the size of your world <laughs> when you're thinking about all of that stuff. The interesting thing with, with this, Hal, in, you know, with, you look at what's going on in the world now, you know, the situation in Europe that, you know, is just terrific to see. And, you know, what we've all been through in the last couple of years with the, with the pandemic. I look at it and, and I think how, how arrogant of us all to think that we've got anything other than the next round in front of us. Why, right. why, do, why, do, we th why do we think that there's going to be a bunch more games? You know, I, I, had a, I, I had a personal situation in the last couple of years where I was, I, was, I was sailing along, you know, life was good. And then all of a sudden I had a, I had a couple of tests Never felt fitter in my life. Had a couple of tests, and then and then six months later, I'm on an operating theatre, having open heart surgery, and you know the biggest the biggest shock of my entire life. But my God, you know things like that just put it in perspective, and you know then you, then you start to look at being grateful for the game and being grateful for the next opportunity to play. But here's the paradox, you know we we talked in the lost start of golf about the concept of of, of gratitude. The number of people who've said that they've really taken those ideas to heart and, and just being grateful for the next opportunity to play, being grateful for being with the buddies and, you know, being out in, out in nature. And far from that just being a sort of fluffy concept, the number of people who've said that they've played some of the best golf of their life because they're not waiting to be happy. They're not waiting for the golf to make them happy. They're actually going out there with a sense of gratitude before they start. And that, and that state of mind that they start with actually allows you to coordinate movement better. It actually allows you to make better decisions. And it's, it's I, I call it going first, you know, go first. Don't wait for the game to make you feel good. Decide that you're going to feel good anyway, because, you know, this this round, <laughs> reinforcing what we said, this round is all you've got. There's, you know, why, why, why assume that there's going to be another one? Unbelievable. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, intention. And uh, I'm drawing a blank on the second word, and acceptance Atten is the third word. Attention. <laughs> yes, there you go. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Yeah. If, if you think about it, that, that, that every golf shot that you ever play, whether you like it or not for the rest of your days, has got, has got three parts to it. There's, there's something that you're going to think before the shot, there's the shot itself, and then there's how you react to that, that shot. So we talk about the idea that having a really clear intention, really clear intention of the shot that you're trying to play, being, being specific, specifically what's the shape you're going to try and play, the trajectory, all of that kind of stuff. Be really clear on your intention, beginning with the end in mind. And then the key thing, and it ties in with what you said before, Jace, where does my attention need to be? to carry out my intention. So on a, on a given day, I'm not, I'm not anti-swing thoughts in any way. On a given day, I might need to have a, my attention on, on something in my golf swing, a particular element of my golf swing. I might need to have my attention on the club head. I might, I might play my best golf when I'm connected you know, to, the, to the tool in my hand. So you, you, you're linking a clear intention to a focus of attention when you actually play the shot. And then the third bit, you know, attitude or acceptance, you know, may be the ultimate mental game tool. If, if somebody were to have put me in a corner and say, what well, if you could gift your players one thing, what would it be that would have the biggest impact? And I, I would say it would be acceptance. That, you know, whatever that golf ball does, wherever it goes left, right, up or down, if you, if you can accept the outcome of that particular shot and move on, then you get to go through the cycle again on the next one. You get a clear intention on the next one. You can focus your attention, accept the outcome. If the, if the acceptance isn't good, if the attitude isn't good, then you start to what I call contaminate shots. You contaminate this shot that you've got now with some previous experience. You've not, you've not put to bed what has just happened in the past that's never gonna come back for you. So it's a real, it's a real simple sort of visual for people to see every golf shot as having, you know, pre-shot, shot, and post-shot, and the and the three key words in those in those three areas would be have a clear intention, work with a coach on where you need to put your attention, but probably the biggest of all, 
you know, whether it's working with a, a mentor such as Hal or a, or a mind coach or whatever, develop the skill of acceptance. Now, acceptance doesn't mean giving up. Acceptance doesn't mean you're not trying your damnedest to, to shoot your best scores. But acceptance is the ability to let go of something that is now in the past, that's never going to come back and allow you to create a fresh intention on the next shot, the next opportunity. You know, I'm a great believer in um, the word possible. What is, what is possible? Is it, is it possible that the next shot that you, that you actually hit could be a good one? Well, for everybody listening, the answer, unless you decide otherwise, is yes. You know, no matter what's gone on before, you can have had a bunch of three puts during the round, but is it possible you could hold this six footer on the 14th for a par? Well, it is possible unless you shut that down in your mind. But those, those three elements, intention, attention, and, and acceptance, if, if, there was, if there was a holy grail for me in terms of the mental game, that would, uh, they, they would be it. So where would you, uh, let's just say that I've got to accept something that wasn't good. Do we blame something? Where does that fit in to those three lines of thinking? Yeah, I think the, the, the problem is with, with blaming something, Al, is, is it's, it, it can be a fix, but what blaming does is, is actually heighten emotion. And it, it can heighten emotion, it can work, but it can actually create a, a, a downward spiral because if you if you blame somebody a caddy or whatever or the club and you get lost in that blame game it generally it'll unravel my, my idea with acceptance is that you that you you accept the outcome based on the fact that you did all you could you created a clear intention you focus your attention you did all you could in the first two parts of the of the shot acceptance isn't, as I say, isn't, isn't being, being happy with a poor shot or not wanting to, to do the best that you can, but it's having that skill of being able to park an experience, being able to park an outcome that you can't get back again and having the ability to reset on the, on, on, on the next opportunity that you've yeah. got. Well, when I use the word blame, I wouldn't necessarily say blame the caddy or blame something else. You know, it could have been just an open face or it could have been, you know, fixing something. So you, you fix that in your intention on the next shot or I don't know, I'm asking. Yeah. I, I think the, the, the best thing to do is after the shot has gone, if you, if you blame it, if you like, I, I like the idea of facts rather than opinions in the, in the acceptance phase is that what was the facts there? What, what happened on that? The, the face was open. I got it a little bit high on the face. I got it off the toe you know, I, I got a bit quick at the top, whatever it is, pick on a fact that you can focus on that'll allow you to start to self-correct. I think there's a big difference between facts and opinions. You know, opinions are things like, I'm useless at this game. This is not my days. I'm, I'm hopeless. All the, all, the, all the opinions that actually spiral the emotions. When you, when you can stay in a facts, facts-based thinking, then we're able to just let go of what's happened and move on and adjust accordingly. Love that. Doc, what are some of the, um, the bad acceptance examples that you see from your, some of the better players you work with? The, the worst kind of acceptance, Chase, is when people do what I call pretend acceptance, where they get the concept of acceptance, but basically what, the, what they're doing is they're saying, well, I'll, I'll go out there and I'll accept every outcome, but there's a little voice in their head saying, I'll accept every outcome as long as it's not that bad. So, so they kind of like fall into the trap of thinking that acceptance is going to make them play great golf. We're not saying that. We're saying that over a period of time, if you can stay with the concept of acceptance, you will get much better at getting the best out of, you, out of your game. A game, B game, C game, D game, whatever it is. But, but genuine acceptance is, 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 is that, is, is actually accepting, accepting outcomes. It's a great thing for people to try on the range. You know, just have a go at this. And before you actually step into the shot, just, just ask yourself the question, am I, am I prepared to accept wherever this golf ball goes? High, low, left or right, can I do that? And what most people report is when, they, when they're genuinely into accepting the outcome, it then, it then they, they feel lighter. And as they feel lighter, the, their ability to coordinate movement actually improves. So 
I, I, I think acceptance, as I say, is in, is in no way a negative. It's actually a very, very heightened state that allows you to coordinate movement even better. And, you know, and, and you look at it and you think, well, you know, what's the option other than acceptance? Not accepting it and getting mad and getting furious with myself and getting uptight and then, you know, one bad shot leading to another, leading to another. For most people who are listening to your show, I think they would agree that it's not the bad shots that co- that's the problem at golf. The, the bad shots are going to happen. It isn't the bad shot. It's the reaction to the bad shot that's the issue. That that one bad shot leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And unfortunately, with this game, you know, it's not like, you know, it's not like football or it's not like cricket or whatever, or tennis to a degree. You know, you can make a bunch of mistakes at those sports and, and kind of get away with it, really. But unfortunately, with the, with this this game we play, it's 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 a brutal taskmaster. That every time you make contact with that golf ball, there's there's a mark goes on the card. So you know, I, I would throw a challenge for everybody listening: is, is 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 think about this year when you're playing golf. Think about the third part of the shot. Think about the post shot. Think about your acceptance levels. Think about your reaction to shots. And it's something that I've seen. It's 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 almost I almost go as far as to say it's a guaranteed area that if you really embrace it and work on it, you can you can experience some some levels of golf that that you've you've, you've not encountered before because it's 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 a, it's a real win win situation. It does it frees up your capabilities. So I'm sitting here thinking this whole time you're talking about that acceptance has a great deal to do with yips, doesn't it? The ability to get out of the yips is because you can't accept an outcome. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent, Al. You, you, you know, you never, you never see anybody yip a, a, a ball on a green when there's no hole there, as obvious as it is to say it, because what, what is a yip? A yip, I think, is a resistance to an outcome. You don't want an outcome to happen. So your body, your body flinches in reaction to the anxiety that's built up. I mean, I think in, 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 in chipping, there is a strong argument that some yips are born out of poor technique. I think if, you know, if somebody doesn't know how to use the bounce on the club and they, they, they set up with the hands leading and get the ball further and further back in the stance, that, that, that the sort of flinch at the bottom can actually be the body trying to put loft on the club um, at, at impact. But certainly, you know, as you said there, a lot of the times yips are exactly because we are resisting an outcome. There was a great phrase I heard years ago. If you're not afraid to, if you're not afraid to lose, you're not going to be afraid to win. And it's kind of like, it's, it's kind of like confronting the worst that can happen and saying, well, can I deal with that? And if you can, then, then you're free. You're free to actually explore the, the upside, the possible. So, so, so Doc, oh, sorry, go ahead, Al. No, I just say it's so true. Um, on that point, and let's, I was going to ask a follow-up question about attention, about the attention phase, but let's, let's use the yips, for example. So, and we talk about the yips a lot on here, and I've asked a lot of, a lot of our guests about the yips in it. And, and I would say, Hal and I both agree that, it, especially with short game, it starts with a mechanical issue, and then it manifests yeah. itself into a, a bigger issue with, with the psychological, psychological side. So my question is, say we got a, a soft little pitch shot, tough, tough shot, short sided, you know, at Augusta next week or two weeks from now under, you know, short sided over a bunker, whatnot. Our intention is to control our breathing and to, let's say, keep tension out of our, our hands. Let's say we've, we've identified that our, we, we add tension at the bottom. So intention is to do that. So our attention is going to be focused on that. And let's say we flinch. So let's say there is something from halfway back to impact that we, we fail on and we, we kind of, we kind of flinch it and and say we had a decent shot, but we know like guarantee that was a little bit flinchy. We have a lot of players we work with talk about, man, you know, I last second, right before impact, you know, how do we call it brain farts, had a little brain fart and it it went offline. Um, How do, how do you, how do you deal with your players with, with that phase where it's just, they're not completely committed. They're not surprised. They know exactly what happened right at impact. How do they control their minds in the, in the attention phase? I think what it, what it does require that, Chase, is that you, you go back to an, an understanding of a couple of key elements, with, especially with the training. Um, one, one phrase for people to hold on to is what, whatever, whatever you resist, you strengthen. 
in the sense that if you're if you're really resisting the idea that you're gonna you're gonna yip uh, during a stroke, it's, it's the actual resistance to that experience that can actually increase the likelihood of the yip happening. So this is a kind of like paradox of a fix, really, is that what I get a lot of players to do is to actually simply go into what I call observer mode, where you actually get them to put them in a, in a, in a situation where they've got a you know, tight lie, chip over a bunker or whatever, and just say to them, I want you to go there and actually give yourself permission that you're going to observe when the yip happens. All you're going to do is to, is to, is to really just notice, become more familiar with what you're actually doing. Now, the paradox is when you actually give people permission to do that and they just simply observe what is going on, the actual likelihood of the yip starts to reduce. It's a real strange psychological dynamic. But what I am convinced of is that the more we actually resist those things happening, the more we strengthen it and the more likely that there is that they're going to keep, going to keep coming out in a pressure situation. You know, Fred Shoemaker has a good phrase. He said, it's far more important to know where the club is than where it should be. You know, so we can have a whole list of things that we should, we think we should be doing in the swing, but probably the most important thing is to actually be really interested in what's going on right now. What are you actually doing? So give yourself permission to observe yourself. And, and, and it's in the observation that you, your system can actually, I believe, start to reset and recalibrate. You know, one thing that we mentioned in the, in the uh, lost out of the short game, is the idea, it's, it's, it's a metaphor that's been used many times before, I'm sure you'll have heard it. You know, the idea of using the back edge of the club. You know, I hate the, I, I hate the, the, the phrase bounce because I think most people who, who hear the word bounce, they just think that golf club's gonna bounce. It's not, it's not a great word, it should have been called glide. We just talk about back edge. But this is something everybody could try, is that imagine that the back edge of, the, of, the, of your wedge is like the wheels of a plane. And basically what you're trying to do is, is to get the wheels of the plane to actually land smoothly. Now you've got three possible landings. When that golf club is coming down, you've got a crash landing. When you, when you go in with the, you, you, you abort the landing or you, or you have a smooth landing. So you've basically got those, those three options, aborted landing, smooth landing, um, crash landing. So simply we get players to just say, okay, hit, hit 10 shots. And really what you're going to do is you're not going to try and create a correct landing. All you're going to do is observe what is, what is actually happening. Now it's the observer mode that's really interesting because you'll get them and they'll go, yeah, that was a crash landing. That was a crash landing. That was an aborted landing. But because they're not trying to fix anything, it's amazing how the system starts to adapt. And then all of a sudden, yeah, that was a smooth landing. That was a smooth landing. That was a smooth landing. It's the, it's the ability to get away from trying to put yourself in positions to first of all observing what is currently going on and the system's really smart when the system really truly understands where your golf club is it can start to adjust accordingly that's excellent i haven't heard anybody ever say that before been around golf all my life but that's pretty clever That's, that's, I'm humbled at that, Alice. <laughs> I don't get called clever too often, so that's nice. <laughs> no, no, no. Real, real clever, real clever. So, Doc, Chase, if, you got something? Go ahead. Yeah. So, if if we go back to kind of that the attention phase again, and I say, you know, say I'm a I'm a mini tour player or uh, playing on the European tour, and I've just been having a hard time, say, committing to the shot for lack of better terms, um, get it, you know, I feel again, kind of flinchy at impact. There's my, my brain is not focused on, you know, a singular focus. It's, it's kind of flaring out different directions. Don't miss it. Right. Don't miss it. Left. Don't do this. I, again, lack of commitment. How, how do you get your guys to, to be better from start to finish of the golf swing, keeping their, keeping their brain locked on, you know, one particular focus. I think what you can what you can do with that, Chase, is is start much earlier with the process in terms of asking the player before the round starts to make a commitment and, and to actually write that commitment down. You know, if if this has been an issue that they're not committing to sh to shots and they're flinching, I'd often say, well, what's what's the opposite of that? What, what's the opposite state to lack of commitment? And you know, they, they might answer freedom. 
okay, right, well, you've got an opportunity today. You, you can either commit to freedom or, or, or not. And you, you write that down before you play. Then, then every, every shot is, a, is an opportunity to stay with your commitment. And I, I would then get them to, to, to grade not so much the outcome of the shot, but actually did they stay with the commitment? Was, was there a freedom in that swing? And it's, it, it, again, it's, it's what you're doing is, you, is, is you're changing the emphasis of what the outcome is. If the outcome is just always about where the golf ball goes, that the flinch will remain because you're resisting the, it's back to what we said about the yips, you're resisting, you're resisting the outcome. But if you change the frame and say, okay, come hell or high water today, my, my commitment is to freedom. I know I'll probably a few shots offline. I'll, I'll, you know, maybe miss a few greens, knock it in the rough or whatever. But, but freedom is more important to me today than, than the outcome because I know that long term it's freedom is actually going to create some outcomes. But it has to be set before the round starts. Don't expect to actually be able to tap into that when you're out there on, on the golf course. It's kind of like writing that. There's something powerful, Chase, that I've found, and maybe it's been lost in the modern world. There's something powerful about having a journal, you know, and, and writing, th actually physically writing things down. Uh, before you start it's kind of like a commitment to yourself and then you go out there and, and and if you've if you've programmed that in before you start you're much more likely to be able to stick with it through through the round uh, as, a, as opposed to hoping to be able to latch onto it once you get out onto the golf course because once the chaos takes over and the emotional brain takes over you know good luck with your commitments if you haven't made them before you started no, I, I think that's so powerful. Um, one of the, I played in a little tournament last week and one of the, my swing thoughts I've, I've used on the podcast before was, but it was to be surprised. And what I meant by that, like it was, I wanted full committed, full committed swings. And if it went offline, it was, I was going to be surprised it went offline versus like the, the, the guidey steery shot where I'm like, Oh, that's going right. That ball's gone, you know, four right kind of, kind of stuff. And it's kind of fun, you know, we're in, in we're an indoor facility, but it's fun to turn the, turn the simulator, turn the track man off or, or hide it and have people hit shots and say, where'd that go? And they they'll say, you know, that went, that was a little bit of a draw or a little bit of this. And, and I'm like, to me, that's what, that's what commitment is. If you can, if you can get locked in and hit it and, and have an idea of like where that went in your mind. And if you're surprised, then it's okay. That's the, those are the shots that we've got to be okay with. That's a mechanical issue that we can address later. But if, if you know, right at contact, Oh, that went right because of this, or Oh, that went left because of this, then chances are your, to your point, your intention, your attention wasn't, wasn't locked in at where it needed to be. And, and, and you're hundred percent right. Jason. And what you're talking about there is, is actually, is actually tuning into your actual experience of what it, what actually went on during the golf swing. You know, I think we talked about it at the beginning. There's, there's, there's so much information out there that people are so much in their heads. There's so much in their heads telling themselves what to do that they're not tuned into their actual experience. You know, and, and I think that's that's where TrackMan launch monitors can be so valuable, but used in the right way, whereby, you know, you, you, ask, you ask a player to hit a draw, did you feel like you, you, the path shifted to the right, but get them to report what they actually felt and, th and then look at TrackMan to see if that matches up to that experience. Because I think far too many players are, are so detached now because they'll hit a shot and immediately they glance at TrackMan to tell them what happened in the golf swing. Well, that's, that's, that's a vicarious experience. That's the track man telling you what happened in your swing. When it's you as the individual, you need to feel toe strikes and heel strikes and pass to the right and pass to the left. Because, you know, I think, you know, it's, we could, we could talk, just get, get me going here. I can talk about this endlessly. But I think we, we are one of the few sports where so many people who play the game are so detached from the tool in the hand, you know, you, you get guys who, who surgeons who are so in tune with the scalpel that they can perform these incredible operations under intense pressure. And they, they will have, you know, they will have such a feel for what the scalpel's doing or the pen or the ax or whatever it is were designed to use tools. But then when they come to the game of golf, they've got no awareness of the, of the tool in the hand and what that tool is actually doing, because they've just got a head full of, I should be doing this and I should be doing that. So you know, to labor the point, it's, it's far more important to know where the golf club is than where it should be. Well, they're not, those surgeons aren't using their big muscles to, to perform surgery, right? Like I think a lot of yeah. it. 
golf instruction world that said you have to use your your hips or your core or your big muscles and it's like would you sign your name on a chalkboard with your big muscles no you'd sit there and ride it with your hands and your fingers and the only thing moving the club to your point is your hands so i i completely agree with well, that you know that i think there's um there's a, a number of occasions you know i've seen uh, videos of, of of tiger and you, you know you'll you'll know better than me on this hell that you know tiger's talked a lot about feeling shots in his hands you know fe feeling s slight subtle changes in what the golf club's doing through an awareness of where, where his hands are well the guy you talked about initially no one felt their hands better than savvy ballesteros I mean, I, I can give you numbers of occasions where he practiced the shot with just his right hand, without a club in his hand. You've seen him do it a bunch. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you know, I, I in the 87 Ryder Cup, I'm playing him and Olaf Thobble, Larry Mize, and I are playing them. And he chili dipped his first pitch shot left to the green. And he uh, – Never saw him do that as long as I can remember. And he stood up over that next shot for a few seconds there with just his right hand. Club wasn't even in his hand, and he was practicing that shot. I'll never forget this. And Larry Myers looked up at me, and he said, what do you think? I said, he's fixing to hold this shot, <laughs> which he did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, he knew where that club was supposed to be based on where his hand was. I, I, I said to a lot of – players you know i think it's a great thing make sure you've got golf clubs if you're serious about the game make sure you've got golf clubs all around your world you know have a golf club that you know if when you're cooking dinner have you know pick pick the golf club up and have it in your hands have a, have a golf club you know a cut down golf club if you're traveling on business you know if you can whatever it is just constantly keep having a golf club in your hand so you just become so tuned into that instrument that in your hand that it, bec it becomes a pen or a scalpel or a brush or a you know as i said you know without going off at tangents we human beings have evolved to use tools that's what's kept us alive you know, if you go through the history of mankind, we have, we have, have evolved and adapted to skillfully use tools to, 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 to catch prey, to, 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 to feed ourselves. You know, most people listening to this will have no problem brushing their teeth. Now, I don't think, I don't think many people will have learned to brush their teeth by trying to rotate their elbow over a fixed axis. They, they, will, they, will, <laughs> they will have learned to brush their teeth by just being skillful with the brush. You know, right. we'll learn to... Do, we, we learn to drive a car not by keeping our hips still and rocking our shoulders from side to side. We become tuned into the wheel. You know, the, the Formula One season started at the, at the weekend. You know, and those guys driving those cars at 200 miles an hour, they are so tuned in to that wheel in their hands that, they're, you know, the, the slightest details that they can pick up on in the performance of the car because they're in, they're in tune with the instrument that they use to perform their sport but not enough golfers are in tune with the instrument that they play the game with. Well, that's a great thing to quit on right there as far as technical is concerned. But I got one more thing I want you to talk about. Talk about our good friend, Darren Clark. I know you've got a lot of really good Darren Clark stories. So share a couple with us. Yeah, I, um, I spent a lot of time with Darren over the years. He's one of he's one of my uh, one of my favourite people. He's a great he's a great student of the game. Um, you know, grew up playing golf in, in in Northern Ireland, and and I've often I've often said that um, watching watching Darren play certainly watching Darren practice was was like watching Picasso paint. And um, I remember one of one of my one of my great memories with uh, with with. I'll, I'll give you two. I'll give you two 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 Darren memories. One one was um, we were at a, a club in London, just outside London, called Queenwood, where he used to be a member. Um, a lot of the time with Darren, we used to we used to play the the nine shot drill. You know, you've you've got straight draw, fade, high, medium, low. So getting again, getting him, getting him tuned into playing, playing the different shots. Again, it's a great drill, I think, for for you know reasonably advanced players for listening to the show to to have a go at the nine shot drill. But we'd get Darren playing the nine shot drill, and he actually started to find it a little bit too easy. So you know, I'd I'd call out high draw, and he'd he just did this beautiful little 
slight variation in his in his shape or low fade, and he just perfectly play the shot with it, you know, five iron, four iron, whatever. So I thought, well, this is getting a little bit too easy. So what we actually started to do with him was that the, the deal was, and everybody should have a go at this, is that I didn't call out the shot until he was at the top of the backswing. And, and, it, and it, was, it was amazing. Even at the top of the backswing, again, just these slight variations in, 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 in ball flight. And it was just, it was just, a, it was just a joy to behold. And you know, the look on his face a couple of times we were doing that, and it, it was almost like, wow, uh, that there's some talent within this body here. And it was almost like, in a way, for Darren, I think he was so gifted with the game, so talented that I think for a large part of his career, that immense talent actually held him back in in a way because he got out on the golf course and his ability to accept anything less than, than perfection wasn't, wasn't great. And I think maybe, you know, in the last few years, you look at him on the seniors tour now, and there's probably a bit more, you know, a bit more perspective on, on the whole thing. And he realizes that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, a wonderful opportunity that he's got. And, I, and I'm sure he's, he's better now at, at what we've talked about today. I'm not saying he's, he's a hundred percent there with acceptance. I'm sure, I'm sure Darren would admit that he, he would, he would, uh, you know, that still gets mad on the golf course, but I think his perspective on the game is, is better. And he, and he, you know, he, he strikes me as somebody truly enjoying the opportunity to create shots. The other one that I, I remember again, it was, it was, it was at Queenwood and we were on the putting green and uh, it was, it was, he was, he was about to fly to the States to play. I think it was the PGA championship I think he was maybe playing in one of the WGC events and he was really struggling with his putting. And, you know, he'd got really quite technical, he'd, you know, gadgets on and, and, and he was very obsessed with, with how he was moving the putter and things like that. And I just tried to steer him a little bit more into what the ball needed to do. So I said to him, Darren, you know, what does this ball need to do to go in the hole? And he, and he, he, descri- he described it. And I said, if you, if you could see that, that path into the hole, and you gave it a colour, what would it be? And he looked at me as though it was the craziest question he'd ever heard. And he said, go on, just, just play with me. And he said, red, I guess. I mean, he's a Liverpool fan. He's a Liverpool football fan. So that's probably where it came from. And what we started to do then was on every put that he, that he had was the idea that was he was going to create an image of a red line from the point of, of, of the ball all the way into the hole. And it, and it got so vivid for him that he, he was actually started to see that the red line actually turned into some lava that was flowing into the, into the hole. So he got a really rich image of the whole behavior of the ball into the hole. And from really struggling, I, I remember the last half an hour, he was just pouring these puts into the, into the holes from all over the place because he, he kind of freed himself up and he was just into this image of the red line. And he went to the States played a tournament he didn't do that well but he said I'm starting to roll a few and then he played in the, it was the WGC at Akron and uh, it was the, it was the second one that he that he'd won and uh, and I still got the text on my phone because he held a bunch of putts over the weekend he held off Tiger coming at him on the back nine when Tiger was certainly at his best and I still got the text that uh, he said he said I just saw I, I just saw those red lines the whole week those vivid red lines going into the into into the hole so um, yeah, it was, an, it was, it was one, of, one of those nice moments where you just suggest something and it kind of like right, right time and right place and it, and it clicked in his mind. But what we, what we would know is that the science would say, what did that do? It, it got him a little bit more into his right brain. It got him a little bit more into his imagery. As a result of getting into the imagery, it heightened his feel for the putt. So it kind of freed him up from, you know, maybe being overly technical with his putting at that point. That's all great stuff. Uh, I love Darren. Great guy. And uh, yeah. we appreciate you being on, Carl. It's, uh, you've given us some great stuff here. I know all our listeners are going to uh, go out and give it some, uh, some attention and uh, hopefully accept it. I've thoroughly enjoyed it, Alex. It's, it's great, too. We don't, we, don't, we don't do enough of this in golf, really. Just share ideas and obviously – you know, with Chase and yourself and your experience, it's just, uh, it's been a thrill for me to come on your show. Well, we Thanks, appreciate Doc. it.
be the right club today. Yes!